And um, I mean, this session is going to be more nuts and bolts-ish kind of session. I, I want to basically go through a couple of tools in detail, but I thought I'd also throw in uh, uh, Moodle Forms as well. Uh, just so that I've got a record in the chat. Um, why doesn't everybody just type into the chat uh, courses, course or courses where you're interested in having the ability to do peer review online? And uh, that way I'll have that. I take, do take the time to go through the chats later after the sessions are over and, and uh, you know, I'll be able to refer back to the courses that you're interested in, in doing. In the meantime, let me go ahead and share my screen and get rid of some Zoom windows here and pop over to uh, the topic for today. Um, again, I want to focus really on the nuts and bolts of the workshop activity in Moodle to show you how that works. Um, it's pretty powerful. It doesn't get used very much. Um, and also Turnitin actually has a peer review uh, functionality to it, which again, we haven't publicized very much to the faculty. Um, I mean, basically the idea is uh, many of us have uh, various exercises where we have students share work in class and provide review on on those works, drafts of papers, whatever. Uh, how do we do that if we're teaching remotely? Um, so again, let me just quickly throw in a little freebie here. You can actually do this in a very simple way with the um, discussion forum activity. And we'll spend a lot of time on this, but just out of completeness. Uh, let me go ahead and add a forum. And I'll call it paper review. You can put in whatever kind of description you want, you know, uh, upload your first draft, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. Um, for this one, this might be one of the use cases where you might actually want to select the option where each person posts one discussion. This basically means each person in the class starts one discussion thread. And it won't go all through all of the other, you know, discussion forum options. But if I click save and display, then you've got basically a um, peer review. You've got a, a place where students can post. And if I switch over to a browser where I'm logged in as a student and I take a look, I should see, well, here's this discussion forum. I have the ability to start a new discussion topic. And as a student, I would just say, here's my paper. I have to give some kind of actual post, but the main thing is I would be able to then as a student take my paper and uh, let's just pull up one of these random documents and post that to the forum, then this is available for everyone in the class to see. And if I go over to another browser where I'm logged in as a different student, uh, I would be able to go in here and see, oh, uh, sample student four posted a paper. I can, as a student, click on that discussion thread. I could download the document, read it, and then um, in my reply say, you know, I liked this, but you really ought to think about this. And I thought the transitions could have been more work. You know, whatever you, you want, uh, kind of feedback you want to have. You could actually have students download the papers, um, mark them up in Word, for example, and drag and drop um, the commented paper back on. And 
you know, you've got a student who has posted their work, you've got another student who has provided feedback, peer review. So this is a very simple way of, of going about it. What do you think are the limitations of this approach? Since we've got a small group, might as well have some conversation. I like matching students with particular papers so that they focus on one and not have the focus diffused by having lots of choices. Right. Hello. So, Same for me. Yeah. So you've got a, a lot more management this way because you have to, outside of the forum, say, okay, Susan, I want you and Frank to pair up and you're both going to post and then you're both going to, you know, so you've got to do more of the, the management, say, manually. Um, what, what about the, the, the issue of having Word? I mean, most of my students, they're lit majors, they don't have Word. They, they use um, Google Docs, for example. Okay, so my post, well, here, let's, uh, let's say that um, I am test landed and I'm going to start my discussion topic. I could say, um, here's my paper. Go to my Google Doc at, and here's the link. And um, actually. But my, I guess my question was, if a student does a, upload a Word document and, you're, and I'm asking them to go into Word and use track changes, they won't be able to do that. Right. So, um, I mean, that's. I mean, that's an issue you're going to have to deal with, with actually Turnitin would solve that because Turnitin converts, converts all the documents. Yep. Uh, the workshop activity, um, you'd have to, you'd have the same kind of thing. So we'd have to come to some class consensus as to, you know, what kind of tools you're going to use and so forth. Well, this Google Docs uh, Word version is—is uh, is that the Pages extension? Is that what I'm remembering? Well, Pages is a is a um, is basically Microsoft Word for Apple products. All oh, right. Okay. Okay. And so you might have some students who are using um, Apple Pages. You might have some students who are using Word. You might have some students who are using Google Docs. Um, and so. You know, if you've got a student who posts a link to their Google Doc, uh, then the other students can follow that link and use the commenting tools. If, um, if you've got a student who's working in Word and they post their Word document, you could have them post it as an RTF, as a rich text format document, and then anyone could download it and open it up even if they don't have Word. The question is whether you want, uh, what kind of feedback you want from the peers. Is it uh, do you want them to go in and mark up uh, individual language in the document, uh, in which case they're going to have to have some kind of uh, close editing tool? You could, you could have, um, uh, you could have students copy all of the text from their Word document into the post itself, rather than uploading the document as a, as a Word file that has to be downloaded. Um, and then, you know, students would have to figure out how they're going to, you know, refer to the, you know, the language in paragraph three, instead of saying this, I think you should say such and such. So there, you know, there are lots of ways of, of handling that. You just need to figure out, you know, what kind of uh, workflow management is going to work for, for your class. But anyway, this is a um, very simple way to do it. But again, it's um, pretty, I don't know, say, loosey goosey. And if you do want individual uh, students to comment on each other's work, then you're going to have to make that really clear in terms of the directions that you attach to the discussion forum or other uh, conversations you have about the assignment. Um, the uh, workshop activity is specifically meant to be for this kind of structured peer review. It uh, is a long-standing core um, activity type in Moodle. 
Uh, used to be pretty flaky, but uh, I don't know, many, many versions of Moodle ago, they completely redid it, and now it is a very tight um, uh, engine for handling peer review. So uh, let me just pop open. Uh, actually, actually, let me go back to the right browser here. So uh, I just would point you to the documentation about uh, workshop that's at the Moodle.org site. Um, and in particular, this video that's up on YouTube um, does a very good job of uh, really describing how this works for the uh, faculty member, how it works from the student's perspective. But it's like 10, 12 minutes long, so I'm not going to actually play it during the workshop here, but I'll just direct, it, direct you to it. With the um, workshop activity, it's, it's sort of like an assignment activity where you can have students turn in assignments. But then tacked onto that, there is this assessment phase where those papers are doled out or allocated out to other members of the class um, for review. And so if we take a look at a finished workshop activity, as the instructor, you see these different phases of the activity, you know, nicely laid out here. Um, there is a setup phase where you are basically constructing the, the, the framework of the assignment. Um, and during this, um, during this setup phase, students can't get in and do anything yet. And then once you are ready, and we'll go through what those different steps of the setup are, you switch it to the submission phase. And uh, during the submission phase, students are uploading their work. They're either typing their, their text in, they're uploading file, um, um, linking out to a Google Doc, whatever works for them. And then, um, during that time, you can also, as the papers are coming in, we'll see that you can um, see how many are being submitted. You'll get a notice, you know, if there are people who, who if students who haven't submitted yet, you have uh, an option here to determine how the submissions are going to be allocated to other students for peer review. And then you switch to the next phase. And during that phase, students will see the um, papers that they have been allocated to review. And you're just basically sitting back and monitoring the peer assessment process at this point. So you really don't have a lot to do except uh, follow along and see as you know students submit their assessments of the uh, papers they've been allocated. These initially start off as all read and as a sample student has provided feedback to sample student four on their paper, uh, the red entry here turns to blue and in terms of the grades given by sample student to sample student four and sample students four would have a uh, grade received here from sample student. So in this case, I've got a fully balanced allocation. Each submission obviously is being reviewed by three other students in this small class. And uh, you know, working through this and logging in as all of these different students to actually get this probably took me an hour or so of, of uh, switching back and forth between accounts. But anyway, um, you, would, you would be able to track how those reviews are coming along. Then you would switch to the evaluation phase where students wouldn't be able to do the assessments anymore and you'd be able to review uh, you'd be able to review the assessments and be able to um, calculate 
not only the submission grades, but also the grades that students would get for doing the assessments. And we'll, we'll see how to set that up in a minute. And then once everything, during this time, students get a message saying, you know, please be patient, everything's being finalized. Then you eventually close down the workshop. And what the students would see then at that point, let me come over here to sample student four. What the students would see would be uh, the, the grade they got on the submission part of the activity, the grade they got on the assessment part of the activity. They would see the, um, uh, their submission and they would see the um, submissions that they were allocated to to assess. So it's fairly, I mean, in terms of structured peer review, this is structured peer review. Uh, so what I want to do, um, let me let me just stop for a minute, see if there are any questions. Can, can students see the, the grades that their, their colleagues get? In other words, if they've commented on a paper at the end, can they see the grade that that's, that paper received? No, right? No, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then what, what, is, what is the file format? Or is, is this converting everything into the same file format? Or? It would not be. I'll show you what it looks like okay. uh, from the, both the faculty member, both the instructor view and the student view. Uh, for each one of these steps, and um, then so you'll be. So students are not line editing; they're they're writing a comment at the end. Uh, yeah, to, you've got different assessment uh, frameworks that you can provide. Oh, okay. okay. But yeah, generally, um, I mean, you could probably set this up in a way that students are commenting on individual bits of the text but probably not inline editing. Okay. So uh, let me switch over to where um, I... Keith, yeah, go do ahead. You, would you mind sharing a link to the Google Doc you're looking at, or is that not oh. something you want to share? No. My, um, my and then, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> and then the other question I had was, um, this is a frequent question I have, because I don't really use any of the grading functions within Moodle, do I, if I use this activity, do I have to assign a grade at the end of it? Or is that something I can do separately? You can do this um, totally ungraded if that's what you want. If you just want a, a way for students to be allocated uh, the work from other students and you provide a framework for providing just non-graded comments, that's one of the options. Okay, great. Um, so, um, let's start off uh, from the faculty perspective. Basically, uh, workshop is one of the stand, one of the core activities here in Moodle. You select it from the activity chooser. Uh, you would basically provide a description, although that's not required. Actually, let me let me leave some of these things out because um, they're interesting ways that the activity you know, guides you in terms of setting things up. So, um, yeah, you have to give the workshop activity a name. Your, one of your, your biggest um, decisions is what kind of grading strategy. And so, accumulative grading is the default. That is um, basically like you setting up a, a grading sheet for uh, a standard grading sheet that each student will use for the um, papers that they are assessing. And you would identify, you would identify different uh, categories or criteria about the paper, provide some description, and give a point value that you're expecting students to assign the papers they're assessing for each of those categories. Then Moodle kind of tallies up 
uh, to provide a score from that student, from that reviewer for that paper. I just mentioned you can do this totally non-graded as comments. Um, this number of errors is kind of, here are the criteria that you're providing feedback on the paper, um, you know, and, and you're presenting them to the to the peer reviewers as just yes, no. Does the student, does the paper meet this criterion? Is it, is it 500 words? Is it, uh, is there a logical flow? It, you know, whatever the clear criteria are that you can have students look at another student's paper and say, yes, this paper meets that. No, it doesn't. And then it would tally up the score based on the number of criteria that where um, the paper falls short. And then you can do a whole full-fledged rubric where you define here are the eight different categories and I'm defining levels of performance on each one of those. And then when a student has another student's paper to assess, uh, they would see the paper, they would see the rubric, and they could, um, you know, just check, check, check. Um, it does a good job in terms of content coverage. It does an excellent job in terms of developing argument. It does a poor job in terms of spelling and grammar, you know, whatever rubric you set up. Um, for this, I think I'm going to select number of errors just as we go through this first time. Um, you can allocate a certain amount of the grade for the grading of what each student is originally submitting. And you can uh, allocate a certain amount of the grade for how well they do on the assessment. Uh, you can determine whether or not uh, students are uploading files or just submitting online text. Um, you can uh, provide some instructions for the students. You know, use the rubric you will see to evaluate the paper, whatever the, um, whatever the general directions you want to provide are. Um, feedback. Uh, in addition to say um, yes, no on the, these criteria, do you want students also have a comment field where um, they can add comments in, in on top of uh, what they're selecting for, you know, whether the paper meets the criterion or not. Yeah, you know, obviously, if you're only doing comments, uh, this is probably going to be not only enabled, but you want to require students to make comments. Um, but the the default is to have that comment field enabled, but optional, and we'll show how that looks to the students. Um, you can. Um, You can allow students to download the paper and comment it using whatever, you know, commenting tools and then re-upload the um, commented file back. You can provide good or not so good e um, example submissions. Um, yeah, you know, there are basically two phases. There's the submission phase. There's the assessment phase. As far as the students are concerned, you can you can basically specify when each of those phases are going to take place. And if you do set up here's here's the time when submissions need to take place, you can you can set it up so that once this time period goes, it'll automatically go into the next phase. I'm going to leave this unchecked, so I'll do all of this manually during the workshop because it'll give me more control. And then there's just all sorts of you know regular Moodle um, settings, which we don't need to talk about today. So if I click Save and Display, I have created this assignment. I haven't. It'll tell me well. You didn't actually tell the students what the workshop was about and you didn't provide them any instructions. And you, there's a green check here, but I really haven't edited the assessment form yet. So I still have a lot to do, but in the meantime, if I'm in here as a student looking at the course 
and I see here's this workshop example, I will see, okay, we're in the setup phase. Uh, the current workshop is currently being set up. Please wait until it is switched to the next phase. Uh, so I could click on this, go back and uh, provide a description. You know, here's what this uh, peer review assignment's all about. And maybe even come in here and take care of that uh, submission um, thing. If I click save and display, then I get some more green checks here. This is uh, yes or no, does this paper meet the criteria? So I can click to edit the assessment form. And, um, you know, you'd put in whatever description makes sense for your assignment. I'm just going to say sufficient content, uh, yes or no. And maybe I'm going to give that a weight of two. And then I'm going to say spelling. I'm not going to be very um, original uh, for the workshop here. Uh, uh, logical argument. And maybe I'm going to give that away to three. Maybe I want to add a couple more assertions. You know, like uh, proper citation. Again, I'm, I'm framing things for this particular assessment scheme in terms of let me let me set up some criteria where a student can take another student's paper and say yes or no does the paper meet these it's a very clear-cut way for students to provide provide feedback I'm gonna click save and continue editing now I've got I've got a number of criteria here some of them are weighted more than others I can um, you know if if, this, if a paper has, say, one no out of seven no's, what's the range that where I want it to show up at? So you can basically set, um, you know, how these, how the accumulated numbers of no's get changed into a, you know, a particular grade. And you know, I can go through all that. I won't take the time. But I save and close. And now I've got everything set up. I've got the assessment form ready. Uh, I'm going to switch to the assessment phase. And now if I go in as a student and look at the activity again. Oops, wrong one. Let's look at the one we're working on. I would see, okay, it's time for me to submit my work. Um, I can start preparing my submission. In this case, um, I left both options for uploading a file or submitting online text. Uh, just to make things easy for the workshop, I'm just gonna type in some text here, click Save Changes. And now, um, as sample student four, I have edited, I have, submitted some work. I could go in here while we're still in the submission phase and, and edit that. Um, I'm going to pull up one other student, uh, test Landa, and just so I've got a couple of students who have submitted work here. Same kind of thing, start preparing my submission. And here's what my pearls of wisdom are that I'm submitting to the assignment. And I see my work here. So as the instructor during the submission phase, if I reload the page here, I will see, okay, um, I expect submissions from all seven of my students. Only two have submitted so far, so there are only two submissions to allocate. You know, theoretically, I would take the time to log in as the other five students and, and submit 
but I don't want to take that time to the workshop. So I'm just going to say, okay, the other five of you, too bad. Um, you didn't get your work in. We're going to switch now to the assessment phase. And when I do that, I will get a notice. Oh, wait a minute. You didn't provide any instructions for the assessment, and you actually haven't allocated these two uh, submissions. So let me go back. This will take me back to the settings page where uh, I can put in, you know, use the yes no criteria to assess the paper and please provide comments, but they're optional. And here, if we go in to allocate submissions, there are manual allocations, there are random allocations, and there's scheduled allocations. If you had a class of 40 students and you wanted each, and you assume each student is going to submit something, and you want each submission to be assessed by four of the other students in the class, I would go into random allocation and say, okay, I want uh, four uh, reviews per submission, and uh, Moodle would randomly allocate those. But instead, uh, since I've got two students who have submitted, and a couple of you mentioned, oh, I like to pair up individual pairs of students, I could say, okay, well, for Test Landa, you're um, your paper is going to be reviewed by sample student four. And okay, uh, if you um, look, not only did you uh, assign sample student four as the reviewer for Test Landis paper, but you assigned sample student four to review Test Landis paper. Same thing here. Uh, you can do that, and so now we've got allocation set up. Um, and if I go back here, um, we're now in the assessment phase. And then if I come in here as test lambda, I would see oh, I've got one paper to assess, and it's pending. So. I've got a paper here from sample student four. You can make this anonymous if you want. That was an option that I uh, didn't select. And then I click assess. And then, okay, is there sufficient content? Well, I'm going to say yes and provide comments. I'm going to say spelling was atrocious and provide comments, uh, logical argument, proper citation overall feedback and again I could re-upload a commented paper click save and close and as uh, test land I see that I had one paper to assess uh, and I have assessed it I have none pending I can go back in during the assessment phase and reassess if I want to same thing for uh, sample student four, when they go in, uh, uh, I get to assess this paper, same basic process, uh, yes, and yes, and yes, and you no, know, you didn't use the right citation style, um, comments, etc. And click save and close, and now I'm done. So um, if I um, refresh the page here, oh, I should have waited first. Um, you can see that uh, we only had these two papers that were assigned uh, to one other reviewer. And so basically, everything has been um, uh, all of the uh, assessments that have been allocated have been assigned. And so at this point, maybe I've given up on the other five students. I'm going to switch to the evaluation phase. And what I would see would be 
you know, this uh, matrix of who is assessing whom. And um, basically, um, if you've got each paper being assessed by four students, for example, um, and you've set up the framework for students to do the assessment, um, then Moodle will just say, okay, how consistent are those assessments? Is there someone whose assessments are way off the mark? So if you've got one student who doesn't take this seriously, they just check no for everything, hit submit, whereas the other students are carefully selecting yeses and nos and for the different criteria and they kind of match up. The one student's gonna, gonna uh, show up as an outlier and therefore Moodle will automatically give them a lower assessment grade than um, than the others who show more consistency. You've got basically, um, you know, how strict or how lax you want to be around about that. I'm going to click the recalculate grades here. It's going to be a, maybe a weird example because I've only got, you know, these two papers and they're only being peer reviewed by one other person. But if we click the recalculate grades, we'll see that um, yeah, everyone got a 20 out of 20 on their assessment because they were just like everyone else who gave an assessment. And uh, based on the yeses and nos that were tallied up, uh, here are the scores on the submissions. This maybe uh, we can see a little bit better what's going on if we go back to the more complete example. Uh, here, this workshop one. And if I go back into the evaluation phase, um, you can see I I um I picked on Read Speaker Student to be uh, a submission that was poorly rated by uh, um, by the other students, and also as a, 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 a reviewer who was out of step with what the other students uh, scored. So you can see that, um, you know, we've got 376s here, the average is 76, we've got 364s, we've got 380s, we've got a 76 and a couple of 72s, we get the averages there. And we can see that, um, um, sample student, basically their uh, assessments of the students that they reviewed the papers on were right in line with everyone else's, and so they got a 20, whereas Reed Speaker, who was just, you know, doing ratings that didn't match up with any of the other ratings by the other reviewers, got a automatically got a, a poor score on the assessment piece of the activity from uh, Moodle. But I have a question here. Yeah. What if that student who has that grade of nine for the assessment, what if that student's right and all the rest of them are wrong? So, I mean, you can obviously review these yourself. This is, um, you have to think about, this is basically a student peer review of other student work. And you're not directly grading the submissions. You're not directly grading, grading the assessments. You can come in and override. You can also determine how lax or strict you want to be. And so if you want to be, um, want to penalize a student less for uh, varying from the other students, you can select very lax and recalculate the grades. And, um, you know, <laughs> they get a, you know, a 14 instead of a, a 9. These show up as grades, individual grades in the grade book as well. So you can always go in and say, you know, um, it, you, you, the workshop activity won't yet let you go in and directly put a grade on the assessment that the student does. Because that would be a whole lot of work. Uh, I mean, this is oftentimes used in very, you know, in large classes where you've got a lot of submissions and you've got a number of peer reviews. The idea is to take the, um, 
the learning activities and the assessment activities and put those to the extent possible in the hands of the students with, and you as a faculty member are just monitoring and you know correcting things. So if you wanted to, if we go back to FAIR and recalculate the grades and you take a look at, you, you know, you spot check some of the assessments and you say, oh, you know, uh, read speaker student, you had it right and the uh, sample student four and sample student five really missed what was going on with um, with the papers that um, well you'd have to actually go back and track who who else is reviewing sample student four and sample student five and and uh, they're you know missing things you could go into the grade book and bump up this nine for read speaker student just by manually overriding the grade and um, you know decreasing. Uh, I guess, George, the idea would be that you know overall law of large numbers would kind of give you a good baseline, and you're really just kind of looking for anomalies or just you know spot checking to make sure that um, the submission grades and the assessment grades are coming out reasonably in your perspective as the instructor. Does that make sense? It seems like it's it's allowing Moodle a lot of control that uh, a lot going on behind the curtain that, yep. that I can't see. I, I was going to comment on that and say I, I agree with you, George, but I, I kind of like the fact that I could announce to the students that I have a way of seeing if anyone is basically filling in random you know responses, and yep. I might use it that way, um, mm -hmm. even as I don't necessarily trust the data because you've raised so many good points about it. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, can, I, can I ask another question? Sorry, yep. I, I assume that uh, as the, the, the student submitting can be anonymous, that also the evaluator can be anonymous. Is that true? Uh, well, let's uh, come back in here. I can't necessarily think of why I might want both to be anonymous, but I... I can't imagine early on in a class that students would like to upload anonymously. You know, it may be that the anonymity I'm thinking of is in the Turnitin okay. peer review. So this this appears to not have any anonymity. That is right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Keith, can I ask sure. a question? This I'll, I'm glad I came to this because I I wanted to learn what this was all about, but I'm feeling like it might be a little like onerous and prescriptive, maybe on on the graduate level in particular. I'm thinking. Right. Right. So. Uh, what I was thinking before was just kind of adding an activity, or I'm sorry, an assignment activity, you know, giving all the instructions for peer review and then allowing this and, you know, assigning who reviews, you know, which paper and then allowing them to simply upload either a marked up document or a Google Doc with comments. Right. That's more what I'm after. I mean, the, the only thing with an assignment activity is that students can't see each other's assignments, which is, you know, what this workshop activity is for, or even the, the discussion forum. But the thing with the discussion forum is that everyone sees everyone's activity. Well, it would be so, a one-to-one -one peer review. Like, I'm thinking about doing a series of them throughout the semester, and I work with very small groups. Like, there's only about eight students. Um, so each assignment, they would each be assigned to somebody different. They would be required to pass their papers to the person who's looking at them, mark it up, turn it in. If I was dealing with 60 students, that would be like right. crazy. But because my groups are so small and I, I largely trust them, you know, to do this work. Right. So, I mean, if you're, you, you could have the workflow where, you know, Frank and Susan, your team, um, share your papers with each other. Right. And then um, mark up the paper. You have to submit the paper to the assignment to me so that I can grade your markup of the paper. But at the same time, you also have to get it back to Susan. Uh, so I mean, you, you just have more. You just have more moving parts that you need to juggle. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe you and I, because I'm going to, I've said this before, I'm going to reach out to you about doing, you know, a consultation about all this stuff, but I definitely, I, I, I'm not sure that this is the best fit for my particular needs, but what? I don't want to 
take let's take a look at turning in and see if if this might if it might fit you better um so here i've got a basic turn it in assignment and um you know i set up the assignment i'm not going to go through all the steps for setting up the turn it in assignments and um all the different turn it in uh, settings for the grade mark and um originality report and so forth but let's say i've got this basic turn it in uh, activity set up and i've got submissions from all of my students and i've got a really plagiaristic uh, group of students because i basically just took uh, documents that were laying around my desktop uh, and downloads folder uh, for the submissions so they're all basically off the internet and fortunately uh, turned it in found them all um, but less well known among our faculty I think is the ability to set up these peer mark assignments and so um, whenever you have set up a Turnitin assignment, you can uh, click on this little gear to launch the peer mark manager. And uh, you know, by default, you don't have any peer mark assignments uh, associated with your um, Turnitin assignment. You would create one. Um, provide instructions, maybe make this 10 points out of the 100, compared to the 100 points for the submission. Uh, you have to specify when students can start reviewing, when they can review till. Um, by default, students don't view the name of their peers during the review process. You can change that to yes if you do want. Uh, by default, if students don't submit something, they can't review. Uh, you can also change that. You can automatically distribute papers or you can manually distribute them. I'm just going to I'm just going to automatically have them have each paper distributed to one other student in the class. Um, you can also set it up to, so that students review their own paper, which uh, might be interesting pedagogically. Um, and this here is, if you select yes for maximum, award maximum points on review, if the student has completed the review, then they would get the 10 points. The default is no, in which case you would actually grade the student's review out of that 10 point scale. Um, I'm not going to click save yet because I don't want to create multiple of these. Uh, so I've got these basic settings here and then you add, you can add questions for the students to address as they are reviewing the papers. Um, you can create your own set of questions. For uh, the workshop, I'm just going to pull some questions from a question library, you know, rate the paper's overall readability. This is a scale type question. It, um, does the paper sustain a coherent point of view? This is a free response. Um, could the readability be improved? You know, a lot of these are free response questions. Sorry, where, where are you pulling these questions from? Uh, there is a sample library. So let me X out of this. So add from library. There's a sample library you can, you can draw from. You can create your own questions and then save your questions to your own library if you want to develop your own library. I haven't done that, so I can't really demonstrate that. But from the sample library, there, there are lots of, you know, kind of general questions that you might ask a student to respond to when they are um, peer reviewing a paper. We can add those selected questions. Uh, and the distribution, I've already, I've already set up for, um, for Moodle to automatically distribute one paper, uh, there, each paper to one other reviewer. So I don't actually have to do anything on the distribution if I don't want to. 
but if you want to do manually pairing up, this is where you would do it. And then if I click save and continue, um, it should show up here that we now have a peer mark assignment. So uh, just quickly, I can go in um, as uh, sample student four. I've already submitted my paper. Um, and uh, hasn't been graded yet, um, but yeah, I have to go back in and adjust the dates. I thought I had saved that. So now we yeah, well, I'm catch up. Really get frustrated at times with how, okay, it says 7.3. Um, turn it in. There we go. Start date of 7.3 for the commenting. So if I come in here and I'm in a sample student four, I can click into this, turn it in assignment, and I would see I now have the ability to start my review. And I've got, uh, I've only got one paper to review. I don't know who the author is or when it was uploaded or what the grade is because, um, you know, those are the defaults. I start the peer review process. Let's try sample student. There are things with fake accounts that don't always work the best. So let me try this fake account. Start the peer review. And it's going to load this peer mark um, reviewing plane. You can see the um, I can see the the questions that uh, I'm specifically supposed to reply to as part of what's been set up by the instructor. I can also uh, come down here in the paper anywhere and just double click to add a comment on the paper. Um, and, uh, you know, put in the qu answers to the questions. And click save, save all of those changes. Going to give me a note that we haven't really submitted it yet. You've just saved what you've changed so far. There are some different tools that uh, you can use as a student reviewer to provide comments on the paper. And when I'm finished, I can click submit, and uh, I will see that um, I've reviewed that paper. Okay, so. Uh, I don't know, that might be a kind of peer review format that's uh, maybe a little bit more in line with what some of you are thinking for the peer review. Uh, you know, it uh, wouldn't matter um, at least whether students uploaded Word docs or PDFs. Uh, if they work in Google Doc, they would want to download their Google Doc uh, file, uh, um, their, their Google Doc as a Word file or as a PDF and upload it into the Turnitin assignment. Moodle and Turnitin will you know, convert it into that reviewable format. So students don't have to download the papers. Um, they don't have to worry about whether they've got Word or Pages or or, or open office or other word processors on their computers. Could, could you just show us what 
the, the professor will see in terms of the markup? Yeah, so now we're going into um, territory I haven't covered yet because I don't use the peer mark in my classes. Um, But we can see that Test Landa here submitted the, a review. And assuming if I click here, I will see there. No, this is for me to review it. OK, I have to find out where. View the received reviews. So click right here. So you as the instructor could also use the peer mark reviewing um, framework, although you also have grade mark and originality report available to you. If I view the received reviews here, um, wait a minute. Click, click on the blue, yeah. Yeah, let's see if that works. No, I'm back here. No, sorry. Okay, so here's the review on student Landa's paper that was submitted by Test Landa. If I click. Now I'm going to have to track down where you get to the point to the screen that shows you where you can actually put the number out of ten for the reviews. So I'll have to, although um, here's what it looks like. I just have to find it. Uh, Turnitin has a short little one pager on grading peer reviews. And so we should get to a screen where I could see um, the reviews and have a field here for putting in the grades. Maybe I'm just not looking down far enough on the uh, on the screen. Sometimes in the Zoom session, parts of the screen get clipped off. No, I'm going to have to find out where it is, or I, I just can't see it with all the Zoom windows I've got on top of um, the Turnitin window here. I will locate that and send it all out to you rather than putz around more. So, um, yeah, again, there are a number of different ways to handle um, the peer review process. You could use the form activity um, as, as, uh, as we were talking about. You could uh, do a lot of this outside of specific activities and just uh, use an assignment to collect the reviewed material so that you could grade the reviewing process. Um, you could then have a separate Moodle assignment where you're actually having students turn in their original work for you to grade. Um, so that's another way to do it. Uh, there's the workshop, there's the peer mark, and turn it in. Um, I, mean, I guess those would be the main approaches for doing the peer review online, um, you, know, you know, to kind of replace some of the processes we would have done in face-to-face -face classes. So uh, with that, let me ask if there are any other questions. Um, are you going to upload this to YouTube? Yep, this will be uploaded. And uh, I've got a, a few workshops from last week to upload as well. So i will be spending some time on YouTube tonight. I, I have a quick question. I, I hope it's a quick question. So on dis a discussion forum, right, that activity, where you said they could, a student could upload a paper, they could also start a discussion, right? So the starting a discussion, I was just wondering if you could say a few words, because I'm, I'm looking into Slack, 
the difference between having a discussion on Moodle? I know maybe maybe that's not a good question because it's not about peer reviewing papers, but. Uh, no, I mean, uh, discussion forum activity is a pretty standard uh, component of all learning management systems and are very important for online courses. Moodle's actually got a fairly good discussion forum, although. I'll watch the video on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I, I wish we would have been able to upgrade to Moodle 3.8 or 3.9 because there's some nice enhancements to the forum activity that um, we're not, we don't have available to us yet because we're stuck on 3.6 until we can get senior projects moved off to uh, my heliotrope submission. Do you think that's a workshop you might have? I mean, because I, I have not used it, and then people keep talking to me about Slack. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, I'm actually on Slack these days for a COIL project that I'm doing. Uh, I mean, Slack has some nice features in that it is, uh, you know, it's pretty um, immediate on students' phones. The the discussion forum activity, and, and I will do a, another session on discussion forums okay. because they're going to be important for our, um, for our remote instruction. Um, Moodle's nice in that there are actually five different flavors of the discussion forum, so you can target it exactly to what you're wanting to accomplish. Um, I think it's much better than the discussion forum in Blackboard. I'm actually working in Blackboard for this COIL project, and it's kind of painful in certain respects. Um, but I mean, the, the, the disadvantage of, of going to Slack or to Discord or some of these other tools for doing ongoing conversations when you can do them in Moodle is that you're sending students to another application. They've got to set up a new, uh, some, something new. They've got to create a new account. Uh, and I think we, we still have to be, con concerned with um, with cognitive overload on the part of our students. If, if you send your students out to Slack and I send my students out to Discord and someone else is sending their students out to Padlet for conversations, then it just becomes very, um, uh, uh, the tools can at some point get in the way of students actually working with the course materials. So there are times when, I mean, certainly we've integrated a lot of things into Moodle, like VoiceThread or Turnitin or uh, a whole variety of other things like uh, uh, Perusal and so forth. Uh, the idea of integrating them into Moodle is that students are still coming to their Moodle course. They don't have to set up a new account somewhere. Um, okay. So they're, they're trade-offs. Just a plea, if you could do, if, I hate to ask you this because I know you're, doing so much but if you could do um a, another session like this these are wonderful on using discussion forum or forum or whatever it's called yep. sooner rather than later as we try to you know it's just taking so much more time to make our silhouette yep that'd be fantastic Thank good you. Yeah, today was well helpful. there'll be another barry's having me send out uh emails tuesday and friday about what's coming up so oh, okay. Thanks. There'll be another one coming out tomorrow, and sure, I'll throw in a, a forum workshop. It's easy enough to do. Okay, I'm going to end the recording, uh, and then we will be officially.